You can go. Final presentation in the dev room for today. Um, we're pleased to have Yannick Moy. Is that correct? Yep. Moy. Uh, of Edacor, who will present some, some new evolution in how to work with pointers in Spark, pointers that were long not included in Spark, but there's a lot of progress being made. Yes. So, so I hope you'll agree with me that there's no best way to end up uh, such a long day than with pointer analysis. <laughs> uh, at least at least I'm very excited by this project. Uh, when I joined Edocor 10 years ago to start working on Spark, I had previously been working on analysis of C++, uh, C. Uh, at Edocor, I've also worked on analysis of Ada. And in all these languages, pointers uh, end up being a nightmare. Uh, and uh, finally, with Spark, uh, we had a language which could be analyzed. Uh, but it was always uh, like this small stone in your uh, uh, shoe that uh, you cannot uh, use pointers in Spark. And so we always uh, had a look for that. And since the last two years, we've been working in uh, adding some support for pointers in Spark. And I'm going to uh, dig into that. So what is Spark first? Uh, it's a subset of Ada. Uh, but it's not, uh, like other subsets, just a coding standard. So it's a subset get that provides you guarantees uh, when you use the associated tools, so the formal analysis tools that come with uh, Spark, which we call GNAT proof. And you can go up to the full functional uh, correctness of usually small parts of the code uh, from uh, uh, something much simpler to achieve, which is a, a semantic coding standard giving you good quantities about the code, like uh, no uh, side effects in functions, no use of pointers precisely. And if you go up between these two, you have uh, here, what we call the bronze level, which provides you uh, uh, guarantees about initialization of the data that you read and uh, uh, correct data flows and no aliasing. Uh, at civil level, that's about uh, absence of runtime errors. So that's a big deal. That's where you, you've got the buffer overflow, integer overflows, all these kind of uh, uh, overflows and other runtime errors that uh, are at risk for safety and security. Uh, and at gold, it's where you start really proving properties. So when you use your contract, not only for dynamic verification, but you start proving in type invariance uh, uh, programming contracts. So the more you go up, the harder it is uh, for the tool and for the user. Uh, but hopefully, the tool helps you uh, uh, go up this scale. So why didn't we use pointers until now? Uh, because that's the view of pointers for Spark. Uh, that's the view, in fact, of pointers for analysis. If you want to do sound analysis where you don't miss any errors. Uh, that's the view of the complexity of uh, using pointers, because yeah, you can en end up with this mesh. But also of all the traps that pointers uh, lead to. So you, in ADA, that's the, as point full pointer support, you can end up with double free. You can end up with uh, memory leaks. You can end up uh, with uh, 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 pointers that point to uh, uh, the allocated memory. And, um, there are a number of concepts in ADA features that help you avoid this, these uh, uh, problems. But still, with unchecked allocation, so the, the ADA uh, name for free, you uh, have all of these. So there are uses for pointers in Spark. Uh, in particular, when you have some data structures that need pointers because they need to grow, for example. So that's typical for containers that uh, uh, don't have a fixed size. Uh, because they have uh, elements that don't have a, a defined compile size. So for example, strings or any indefinite uh, type in ADA that you must uh, point to. That's the same for class-wide types so or the objects in ADA that, we, uh, that were mentioned before. Uh, or because you have a recursive data type. So if you want to have your own list or tree or similar recursive data type, you need to use pointers. So what changes with uh, ownership? So this concept that has been used in other languages, the most famous being Rust. What changes with ownership is that it brings this, this great uh, crew solution, so concurrently uh, exclusive rights, which is exactly what you need to analyze code. So that's what already we're using in Spark for analyzing code with references. So references are these special pointers, if you like, so pointers at the uh, executable level, but not at the source code level. That uh, can be manipulated when you pass arguments to a function in out, uh, input, in, uh, or output. And uh, in that case, that's uh, 
Spark already analyzes the calls to make sure that there is no conflicting aliasing between things through which you will write. So there will be only one writer in the, in the function. And if there's one monitor, there won't be any reader uh, through another path. So we already do that in Spark for references. So of course, for pointers, we want to do the same, same kind of non-analyzing check with some addition, because uh, if you have pointers, you can assign pointers all over the place. So you can create your own local aliases. And this is the kind of thing we want to prevent. And that's where ownership ki kicks in. So when you are going to assign uh, a pointer to another object, you're going to move the ownership. And if you stop that, uh, you, you can do useful things, but uh, you're still stuck, for example, if you want to traverse a recursive data structure without destroying it, because each time you're going to uh, uh, move your, uh, your uh, current uh, pointer, you're going to destroy it, you're going to take the ownership of the things you had before. So what you need for that, you need uh, some local handles that will restore the ownership when, uh, when the scope is finished. So when, where we borrow, observe the data, that maps to the REST concept of mutable uh, borrows or simple borrows. So what's provable uh, with this uh, pointer ownership? So we have a prototype right now. And uh, what you can do is you can write this kind of code with a, a pointer type uh, that uh, is an excess. So that's the way to uh, denote in ADA uh, pointer to T. And you can implement these swap contents or swap pointers. And so uh, uh, I don't show the, the code of the body, but uh, you can imagine very easily swap contents will swap what's underneath these two pointers by differencing them and using a temporary variable. And swap pointers will simply swap the uh, actual values of x and y. That's why swap contents takes just input parameters, x and y, and swap pointers takes in out, because it will change the value uh, of, these, uh, of these objects. And so if you put the right precondition, postcondition here, uh, not only you can prove with, uh, with the Spark tool, you can prove that all of these uh, differences, uh, so in EDA it's dot all to the reference an object are safe, so the pointer is not null. And you can prove what you usually prove with Spark, absence of, the, of uh, runtime errors in general, uh, and uh, uh, contracts, so here, that the post condition holds. Uh, so it's, uh, they are essentially the same, except here you're repeating the non-nullity of the arguments. Uh, and all this, uh, because we can assume, thanks to the ownership uh, system put in place, that when swap contents and swap pointers are called, their respective arguments are non-aliased. That's very important here, otherwise you cannot verify this, uh, the, uh, this implementation. So that's what it does now. Uh, let's look now at every one of these operations that I mentioned, the move, uh, borrow, and observe operations. Uh, so the move is when you assign a pointer. So that's either an assignment statement or when you're passing an out or in-out parameter in, uh, uh, in the procedure. And uh, the thing that you're assigning from loses the ownership of the data and it becomes unreadable. And the ownership goes to the thing you're assigning to. So for example, uh, the implementation of swap pointers is, can be this one. I take uh, a local variable temp here that takes the ownership from the uh, value pointed to by x. Then I can write into x. So I, I cannot read x, but I can write into x the, uh, uh, the value of y. And then I can write in y the value of temp. That's correct. So now if I make a mistake, so for example, here, instead of uh, writing temp into y, I, I write y. Well, y was moved already here. So I cannot uh, move it again. Uh, it was moved into x, so I cannot move it again. And, and uh, our borrow checker, so our implementation of uh, these rules in the compiler, uh, say that there's no, uh, no sufficient permission for, for doing that. The object was already moved. If we make another mistake now, so uh, instead of moving temp, I'm moving x. So here, y was moving x, x was moving y. So that uh, seems like not very useful, but uh, at least for these two lines, that respects the ownership principles. But when you return from swap pointers here, it realizes, so that's why it pointing, it's pointing here to the uh, uh, spec file, it realizes that there's not enough permission for x. So x, you're supposed to return to the caller with uh, this uh, uh, parameter uh, with full ownership of uh, the underlying memory. There's an implicit assignment, and here it realizes that's not possible because it was moved here. Now let's listen to the borrow. So borrow occurs when you're passing an input parameter of uh, access type or pointer, and temporarily the uh, uh, actual parameter, 
uh, in the call will lose ownership of the thing it points to and it will regain it automatically. So it's an input parameter, it doesn't change through the call, the, the actual value of the pointer. And there will be non-analyzing checks, like for references uh, uh, before, uh, that uh, there's no uh, possible conflicting uh, aliasing between the arguments. So for example, if I uh, s call the swap contents, so swap contents was uh, taking input parameters, uh, X and Y are okay, there are two different pointers here, X and X is not, and it will be caught by the non-analyzing text. <coughs> now let's look at the uh, more complex borrow, the local borrow. So we can uh, define a local variable here of an anonymous access type. That's uh, how we distinguish this from the, the move. And uh, here, we're the, because we're writing that, the, uh, the ownership system understands that we are borrowing X into this local variable. What it means is that for the scope of the local variable, uh, x becomes unwritable. And so here I can still write, but through the, the borrower to, uh, to the underlying memory, pointed to by, by x still, but that it doesn't own. Uh, so I can still, uh, I can implement swap contents like that. Let's look at uh, what happens if I make a mistake. So if here, instead of local x, uh, the borrower, I mentioned the, the borrower we, uh, I get a, an error that says that the object was already borrowed before. Uh, and, and that's all for borrows. Finally, last operation, the observe. So uh, uh, the borrow here was the mutable borrow of uh, Rust. The observe is just the regular borrow. Uh, that's for passing parameters of uh, a composite type. So an array, a record, or a combination thereof that has pointers in, in them. Uh, here we're going to consider that the parameter uh, only provides a read-only view to all the memory underneath, all the uh, possible tree of data. And that's the same for uh, defining a, a constant of this type. Again, the top-level object in ADA is immutable, but in Spark, uh, for this ownership uh, uh, system, we're going to consider that all the tree of pointed to data is al also uh, immutable. That allows formal analysis. And uh, after the, uh, the scope of the call or the scope of this constant ends, then the original object re recovers its ownership. During the scope, both objects, the borrower and the borrower, have a read-only uh, permission. So let's look at an example. Uh, so yeah, so, so this was for constant and parameter. The uh, more complex uh, observer is the, like, like previously, the local uh, observer. And here we recognize it, uh, that's our choice of design, uh, by saying that it's local variable of an anonymous access to constant. So not a name type like before. And here, instead of a move, again, uh, we do uh, an observe. So Y has a uh, read-only access to the underlying memory. And during its scope, Y also has a read-only access. So I can read local Y here and the, the memory pointed to. And I could replace, replace this local Y by Y. So that works. Uh, when I make a mistake, so here, so if I move the uh, final assignment uh, up in inside the scope, so here in the scope where Y is uh, observed, it's an error to try to uh, write through Y. It's a read-only access to the underlying memory, and, uh, and that's what the ball checker says. So there are some limitations. Uh, we are only focusing right now on what we call in ADA pool-specific uh, types. So not the general access type that uh, when you define the, the access type as all or constants, because these uh, are much more liberal in ADA and uh, that would be much more complex to define the rules for uh, having proper support in Spark. So it, it will be either limited or there would, won't be any possibility to uh, take the address of a variable in the stack. So that's the kind of things we're discussing right now uh, to define the exact rules of what we want to allow and what we can implement in the, in the checker. Uh, in any case, it will be less powerful than the uh, system of Rust. Uh, there are, we don't plan to have any annotation, in fact. Uh, we want to uh, have something that integrates very well with existing code or code that uh, is regular ADA, even if it's new. And so we don't plan to have annotations for lifetime. Uh, we want the borrowing observing relationship to be statically known. Some of these constraints come from uh, the wish to uh, have no additional annotations, and some other come from the fact that we want to do some, the goal is, is different than from Rust, we want to be able to do formal verification. And so, for example, this uh, statically known relationship is something very important. Otherwise, you end up with things that are much more complex 
uh, like uh, what researchers do, uh, exploring formal verification are first uh, end up with. Uh, and uh, there are things uh, that are specific to ADA. So when we adapted these, these ideas to ADA, there are different types. And uh, for example, array types, when you uh, take an element of the array, uh, when you move it, you're going to mentally move all the array because you don't know where, uh, which cell it is. So if you want to, for example, swap elements in an array, you will have to do it through a call so that the call uh, uh, hides the fact that two different elements of the array uh, are, are, are moved. You, can, you won't be able to do it uh, just uh, taking uh, uh, index i in a variable and then doing the swap locally. So there are some kind of limitations that come from uh, this, uh, uh, the, the limitation of the static analysis. Uh, in terms of roadmap, so what we expect to do by the end of uh, uh, this, uh, spring, this spring, so May, June, when we issue the GNAT community release, which now includes uh, Spark and uh, GPS and everything, uh, we hope to stabilize the uh, reference manual rules. So we're still uh, working on this. So if you want to have a look, if you're curious, that's uh, there, that's online. And uh, yeah, it's still a bit evolving to, to make sure that we have something uh, sound uh, that maps to uh, the implementation. Uh, to complete the implementation of the ownership checking, so what I showed was what's working right now, but uh, there's still a lot of work to make it work in all conditions uh, and to, uh, to uh, implement all the rules that are already defined and to adapt the flow analysis engine. So Spark uh, goes in two different stages for analysis. There's this flow analysis that does uh, local static analysis, simple one for all the flows uh, reaching essentially the bronze level. And then there's proof, where we use provers under the hood and uh, to reach the higher levels uh, of guarantees, so silver, etc. So we want to, to finish that flow analysis, which uh, we haven't started. And for the next years, uh, uh, we want to support local borrow and observe in proof, which uh, we don't do right now, so it's more complex. To support proof of our recursive data structures, and here what you want to be able to do is to quantify over the contents of these things. So for all elements of my list, I have this property. So that's more complex. We have uh, prototypes in the underlying uh, technology Y3, and we have to leave that to Spark. Uh, and to check absence of memory leaks. So the rules are set up so that we can check that by proof, and we haven't done that yet. And I think that's all. Thank you. Yes? Uh, first, I really like this uh, whole project. Okay. I think it's cool too. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is about, at the beginning of the talk, you talked about use cases. Yeah. And one use case was, for example, this container where you don't know how much content will be in the container. Yeah. Um, and now you are, at the end of the talk, you point out a few limitations. Yep. So my, I wonder, um, how does, can you circle back to your use cases and yep. explain, for example, is it possible to create an ABL tree or something like that? And now with this new um, um, technique now, so for yeah yeah so so it's it's planned, but the proof support right now doesn't support uh, recursive types yet. But, but, but it will it will it will. So the three use cases that that I mentioned it will. Uh, the first ones the the first two ones were were are the easy ones that are supported already. Well, partially because flood analysis is not there yet, etc. But the just uh, having a tree uh, which is not recursive yes is already supported. Yeah, so that's cool. <laughs> Welcome. Yes? The analysis, the analysis uh, you're doing work, work local to the function, or do you need uh, the whole Yeah, so Spark works locally. So in, in, able, in order to be able to do this powerful analysis uh, using SMT solvers, you have to, to be modular. Uh, otherwise, do something else like um, uh, symbolic execution that traverses the thing and bonded symbolic execution. So we are in the realm of deductive verification where we really uh, uh, are looking at a piece of code, although we do things like inlining, so there are ways to go around these limitations. So uh, I saw that the one of those is, is that the single pointer is not borrowed twice, right? So mm -hmm. it appears twice in, the, in a call. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. In the call, right? yeah. And what happens if the pointer uh, is a field uh, in an object yeah. uh, that was received by the function? So that, that's the same. So, so I mean, what I, I just used examples that use a plain variable, but the same uh, uh, applies to fields. I mean, uh, that, that fields are followed uh, individually. So what we have in terms of implementation is that uh, we unfold on demand 
the, the structure of the tree of, of the type to, uh, to go deep in, inside the, the fields of a uh, given variable. So you can borrow, for example, if you have a, um, something that points to a